Cool. Um, so yeah, sorry for the delay starting now. So today we're talking about center and spread, a few announcements. Um, so we have the second round of tutoring starting now this week. So you can sign up on Piazza for that. And then as usual, we have our new vitamin due on Wednesday. Homework eight is due Thursday, turn in on Wednesday for bonus point. And um, project two, checkpoint one, due Friday. And finally, we also have our mid-semester grade report. Uh, so we finally put this together. Sorry for the, day with the delay with this. So this is something that we always typically kind of release um, after the midterm. And it it's really useful to look over. We'll actually go over it right now, actually. Um, but I encourage you to take a look at it in more detail. Um, and so it's pretty cool. So it uses kind of all the stuff we've learned so far in this class. It's essentially a Python notebook. Um, and it reads in the scores from the class. So it's like all the assignment scores. So we have like all the homework scores, lab scores, mission scores. Uh, and then it's used to create the composite scores for the class. So I won't go too much into the details of like how all of it works, but you can read through the notebook. Um, it's available there from the slides. And the composite score basically is just calculated using kind of what we've uh, mentioned in the policies. Um, and the first project is not included. Yeah, good question there. So this does not include the first project. Um, and so first of all, here's the composite scores to date. Um, so we see here that you know, almost everyone has a composite score of 40% or higher. Um, and again, we're only like halfway through the course. Project one isn't included in this discussion attendance, vitamins, none of that is included actually in this yet. So your composite scores are likely higher if you've been doing all those things. Um, and you know, our goal is really to come up with a plan for anyone who doesn't have over 50 in their composite score right now. So um, you know, if, if that's you, like please reach out to us directly. Um, our goal is to make sure that we can provide, you know, just regular support and come up with a plan essentially um, for you to succeed. So we really want everybody to succeed in the course. Um, and yeah, when you open it, it's going to be in a PDF. Um, I'm just showing you the notebook version of it. Um, all right, so that's kind of the composite scores. And then lots of you learned about percentiles. So we actually went ahead and calculated the percentiles here. So 25th percentile is 74, 50th percentile is 83, and 75th percentile is 89. So these are just composite, composite scores. Um, and we can also look at the midterm scores here. So this is the distribution of the midterm scores. Um, and so it's slightly different. It's a little bit more spread out compared to the distribution of the composite scores. That's typically what happens. Um, and the percentiles here, so 25th percentile is 60, 50th percentile is 72, and 75th percentile is 83. So you can see the percentiles there. So a little bit lower in general. Um, and then we can also see them on top of each other too. So the composite scores are these gold bars, and then the midterm scores are the blue bars. So, you know, midterm definitely more spread out, kind of shifted out a little bit to the left. And so typically what we see happen at this stage of the, of the course is like the composite scores will kind of start moving to the right actually for the next few weeks towards the, towards 100 basically. So everything starts moving there as like the projects get integrated and the vitamins and all that. Um, and then with the final score, things come back a little bit too. So that with the final scores, things tend to look you know, a little bit more to the left as well, but a little bit more spread out. But it's just hard to say how things will go. Every semester is a little bit different. Um, and, um, you know, main thing is we understand this is a unique semester. So we'll definitely um, be able to take all that into account. And we understand, you know, this is just a different time for everyone. So we'll certainly be taking all that into account. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people might be asking, like, how do you grade, come up with your actual um, scores or, or your actual grade? What does the score correlate to and all that stuff? Um, so it's just really hard for us to tell you that right now because it just depends on what happens for the rest of the semester. Um, but, you know, the most important thing is that 
75 percent of the class gets a's and b's that's typically how it's been and that's probably how it's going to be most likely um and so you know i think in general the best is to not focus too much on what the actual grade result is going to be just try to focus on your own performance and just trying to do you know improve your performance and also just like learning the material that's really the most important thing um regardless of what grade you get in this class it's probably gonna have very little impact on your actual career um it's really just about learning the material so you know you should consider it a success if you've learned something new in this course that's really the goal um, and something that you can use later on um, regardless of you know what you end up doing after this so um yeah with that i think we'll get back to the lecture itself um and you do have a way to calculate to actually find your composite score you can also calculate the midterm score yourself as well using this notebook so if you go to the notebook you can calculate your own composite score using your scores but i believe you also have the composite scores for you um the notebook mentions where to find that so just take a look at the notebook uh probably later on after the lecture for more information Cool, so weekly goals for this week. Um, so today we'll be talking about how do we describe distributions? How can we summarize them? Um, and so we'll go over some questions there. And then on Wednesday, we'll go into a bell-shaped curves. So we started seeing a lot of the curves that look bell-shaped. So we'll go over what that means and why they're important. And on Friday, we'll go into the variability of sample averages. So you can take the average value of a sample. How does that vary? And there's some interesting properties about sample averages when you have really large sample sizes. So we'll talk about that on Friday as well. So this week's all kind of just distributions. So firstly, center and spread. So the main, I guess, motivation for center and spread is to think about you know, answering some of these questions. That's kind of why we're talking about center and spread. So, you know, some common questions when you're looking at some distribution of data or distribution of data like in your sample is, you know, how can we quantify things like what's the center of the distribution or what's the variability of the data that I'm seeing here? Um, you know, why do many of the empirical distributions that we generate seem to come out bell-shaped? So a lot of times when we've done like simulations, right? Uh, typically the simulations, the empirical distributions have look pretty bell shaped look like a bell essentially um and so why is that like is that just coincidence we've been seeing that a lot in this course so far uh and then also there have been some questions many people have asked this question during lecture but it's you know how what kind of sample size do you need and how does that relate to the accuracy of your estimates so you're trying to estimate some thing about a population how big of a sample do i need like is 30 enough is 100 enough what's what's you know what do i need and how does that actually relate to accuracy so these are some of the questions that are going to motivate this week's lectures. So the first concept we'll talk about to answer these questions is the average. So one concept when you when you have like a set of data, you have a distribution, and you're trying to summarize it in some way. If there's like one number you have to pick to summarize a distribution, this might be one of the numbers you might use. And so this is the average. We'll also just call it the mean in this course. And the way you calculate this is basically if you have your data set, so let's say our data set is just four numbers, so it's two, three, three, nine, then the average is you sum up all the values that you have and then divide by the number of values. So in this case, we have four individuals, you could say. So you just sum up all their values and then divide by four. And so that gives us an average of 4.25 in this particular case. And so what's interesting about the average is it's not necessarily a value that's in the collection or in your data set. So in this case, our values were 2339, our average is 4.25. 4.25 actually isn't a value in our data set. So if you had this set of individuals and you said like the average person is 4.25, like that doesn't actually really mean much because there's there is no person in this data set that's 4.25. Um, but it's just the average of their values is 4.25. So that's kind of typically the way to think about it. Um, and then it's also interesting that it doesn't need to be an integer. So in this case, your values could be integers, but then the average is a float essentially. So that can also happen. Um, and again, that's because we're dividing by something. 
And typically, I mean, always your average is going to be between the minimum value and the maximum value. So in this case, it's going to have to be between two and nine. Because two is the minimum value, nine is the maximum value. But it's not necessarily halfway in between. Um, so we'll go to some examples of what that means and why that is. But your average isn't necessarily like the midpoint of your data. Because if you have some really large values on one end, that pulls the average out. So let's we'll use some examples of that. Um, and the, what's also interesting about the average is it has the same units as our data. So if like our data set here is in um, like pounds or something, then the average is also going to be in pounds. So it's a it's useful that way as well. Um, and then I wouldn't worry too much about this one, but sometimes this is called a smoothing operator. So it's kind of a mouthful there, but basically what it's saying is that um, if you have like a lot of values in your data, it's kind of like smoothing out your data. So it's like summarizing it with one number essentially um, in, in, in a way that is kind of taking into account everybody's contribution, we could say. So like the two, the three, both threes and the nine, they're all taken into account when we calculate this average. None of those values are ignored. Um, and then they're also summarized with this number. So let's see some examples of how we can actually calculate um, the average here. So let's, we're going to take the same values that we already had. And so one way we can calculate it is using the definition. So definition of the average is just sum up the values and then divide by the length. So some of the values divide by how many there are. So if we do that here, we get 4.25 as expected. Another way you can take the average of a set of numbers is just use uh, NumPy. So you could do np.average. So again, np is referring to NumPy. So you could do np.average values. We get the same thing. Um, you can also do np.mean. So mean is essentially equivalent. Um, so that's also going to give us 4.25. And then if you wanted to do it like basically how we did it by hand um, in the previous slide, you can actually just write out the values too. So you could say, two plus three plus three plus nine, sum all that up, divided by four. So these are all equivalent, all of these four ways of doing things. Um, in practice, you probably won't want to do it this way because this last way, you might make a mistake, I accidentally type like a four instead of a three or something. So I would recommend probably these two <laughs> in general. Um, and then another way actually that you can do it to think about it is, is um, if you distribute this divided by four to each number, um, then you can do it like this. So you can say two times one fourth, three times two fourths, because there's three comes up two times, and then nine times one fourth. So that's just another way of doing it. Um, it's equivalent, but sometimes people like looking at it this way too, because it, this is another way to think about like your, it's almost like a weighted average essentially. Because two is weighted one fourth, but three has a higher weight of two fourths because three appears two times. Um, so it's essentially an average is a weighted average, but the weight, which is this number here that's being multiplied, is just um, you know how often that number appears basically. So it's an equivalent way to think about it, and you get the same results here too. And so let's put all these values in the table. Um, so this isn't that interesting, but it's basically all the values in a table. And so this table just has one column and we have two, three, three, nine now in a table. Reason I did that is because I wanna show you what these values look like on a histogram. Um, so we're gonna make some bins here and then just plot this in a histogram. And so we see here, we have you know this bar at two and then we have a bar at three that's twice as tall and then a bar at nine out here. And so if you remember the average is 4.25, so the average is actually like somewhere around here. So it's interesting because when you look at just these numbers, you know, the midway point between these numbers is maybe like a little bit closer to nine or something like that. But um, 4.25, it's a lot closer to these values here. Um, that's just because you have a lot more values here. Um, but then the nine kind of like pulls the average out. So if instead of a nine, we just had like a four here, then things would have been symmetric around three and three would have been our average, but the nine brings the average out. So even though like most of our values are just around here, two and three, that's most of our values, but the nine that's out here pulls things out. And so that's where our average moves out to here to 4.25. And so another way to think about it, which is really common is if these are actual like weights, 
these bars or weights on like a scale, then the mean is where you would have to put um, kind of the lever at the bottom to make sure like the scale balances um, properly. So this is kind of where we'd have to put it to balance the scale. If we put you know, something out here, then things would tip over to the left because there's too much weight here. If we put something right at three, it would tip over to the right because this weight out here is gonna drag things down a lot more than the weight that's right next to the middle. So 4.25 is kind of like the, the balance point. So that's another way to, another way of thinking about it. Um, and then what's also interesting is we had two, three, three, nine. If we have the same values, but like, let's say we bump up how many times they appear, but proportionally. So let's say instead of one, two, we have 10 twos. Instead of two threes, we have 20 threes. Instead of one nine, we have 10 nines. We can make a similar table um, like that and draw a histogram. And that histogram is gonna look essentially the same because it's the same proportion of values. Um, and then the average is also gonna be the same here too. And so really that, that same principle holds where like 4.25 is kind of the balance point. So um, that's the main thing to kind of keep in mind here is it's, it's less about like how many values you have, but it's really more about how many times does each unique value come up? That's really what matters. Um, and it, it's interesting because I mentioned unique values a lot and that's because that's what a distribution is. It's basically like plotting the number of times each unique value comes up. That's essentially distribution. And so um, an average is basically, you know, taking the average value, but accounting for how many times each unique value comes up. So if a certain value comes up a lot more often, it's gonna contribute a lot more to the average. So any questions about averages uh, before we continue? Okay. So here's a question. Um, we talked about median before in this class. So median is kind of the you know smallest value such that 50% of the data is less than it. It's essentially the 50th percentile. Um, and so here's a discussion question. So in these two graphs, are the medians, you know, are the medians the same for both of these graphs, both these distributions? Um, are the means different? Are the means the same or the different for both of these? And if you say different, which one is bigger? So some people saying the same. All right, so yeah, so the medians are the same because if you look at kind of the first 50% of the data, right? So that's basically like all the values up to the 50%, that's probably gonna be like up to three or so. Um, I mean, you can't say exactly just by looking at the histogram, but looks like at least kind of the left half of this set of data is like basically the same here. Um, and so the median is gonna be the same, um, but the, uh, the average will be different than the mean is gonna be different. Um, and the main reason for that is because this number, which is a five here is like, is a 10 out here. And so that's gonna drag the average out a bit. And so on the right, the mean will be a little bit different. So again, median is the same, but mean is different and mean is larger specifically on the right side. Cool, so yeah, this is just kind of a breakdown of both of the two measures here. So mean is the balance point of the histogram. So like that's where you have to put something to like ensure that the whole histogram stays on balance, doesn't tip over. Um, whereas the median is just the halfway point of the data. So basically half of the area is on both sides of the median. That's what the median has to be. Um, and if the distribution is symmetric, about a value, so symmetric means that like both the right half and the left half look exactly the same, like from the middle of it, then um, that means that the, at the mean and the median are the same. So that's what that would mean. So if you go back to this um, discussion question, this histogram on the left, this is actually symmetric. So if we draw the middle point, which is like here, three, then everything to the right of the middle point, everything to the left, they look exactly the same. They're just like mirror images. And so this is symmetric distribution. And so in this case, the median is gonna be the same as the mean. Um, and then if the histogram is skewed, which means like, when it's skewed, it means like this, it seems like it's sticking out a lot more on one side compared to another. Um, then the mean is pulled away from the median in the direction of the tail. So visually that's this graph on the right. So this histogram 
if you look at kind of the midpoint in terms of area, like 50th percentile is probably going to be at three here, just like the last one. Um, you have this bar the same area, but now it's that bar is dragged out to 10. So that's this is considered a tail. So it's like it kind of goes down into the right, whereas the left one just goes down pretty sharply, but the right side goes like down to the right. And so like slowly. And so that's this is considered like a tail essentially and skewed. Um, and so because of that, the average is going to be dragged out as well. Um, and so typically the, the way to think about it is like if you see a histogram with a bunch of data near some region and then you see like one or two points like way out somewhere, they're probably going to move the mean in that direction. So the mean is influenced by it, like those outliers essentially. Um, whereas uh, medians are not. And so someone pointed out the median is the 50th percentile. That's correct. That's actually the basically the definition of median is 50th percentile. Cool. All right. So now let's go to standard deviation. Um, so if you haven't heard that before, no worries. But basically the idea um, here is we, need, we now know how to think about what's the kind of center of our distribution. We just take the mean. That's how we can think of what's the center. That's the balance point. All right, so balance point, mean, center. Um, and so that's a good way to describe distribution. But if I have some data, if I have two different data sets and they have the exact same mean, that still doesn't really tell me like how they compare to each other. Because one might vary a lot more than another. Like if I have a certain set of data where the mean is like five and like all the values are just around five, that's very different than a set of data where the mean is five, but like the values vary a lot. And they could be as high as like 20 or negative 20 or whatever. So just looking at the mean isn't quite enough. It's also useful to get a sense of like, how wide is, is this distribution? Not just where is it located, but like how, how does it vary? And so that's the idea here. Um, and so one idea you could say is if we want to define the variability distribution, one thing we could do is, well, we could just take the biggest value and then subtract the smallest value. And that could be one way to do it. So if we go back to our notebook here, Let's say this is our distribution of our data. So one way to think about variability is, well, I could just take this largest value and then like subtract the smallest value. Um, you know, so that could tell you one way to do it as well. Um, but one issue with that is, you know, what if I had all of the data just on the ends? So if I had like, you know, a lot of twos and a lot of nines and like nothing in between, that could be one distribution. Another distribution could be one where I have a bunch of values here in the middle, like 4.5, and I just have like one small value to the outside and one small value to the right. Um, both of those would have the same kind of like difference between the max and the min, but the data is distributed very differently. Like you could have a lot of data distributed on the ends, or you could have a lot of data distributed in the middle, and then it goes out. And that max minus min is going to be the same for both of those distributions, but those distributions look very different. Like one is actually nicely distributed in the middle here. And then one is like out on the ends. So both of those things are very, both the distributions are very different. And so using this biggest value minus smallest value isn't really telling you the full picture. It's a little bit problematic for that reason. Um, and yeah, because it doesn't tell us the shape. And so what we wanna do instead is think about how far away things are from the mean. So that gives us a better sense of variability. Um, because if you have something that like, is always around the mean, then that's a, that's a much tighter distribution than something that's like always out on the edges. Um, it's kind of like if you're throwing darts at something, right? Like if you, you're trying to throw darts at a bullseye and you throw a lot of darts like near the bullseye, that's much more tightly around the bullseye than if you just throw things that are like all far away from the bullseye. Um, and so you wanna get a sense of what's the variability around the mean. That gives you a better sense of like how, thing, how close things are to the average. Um, and so we need a way to basically measure how far away things are from the mean. And we need a way to quantify this with like a single number. So that's, that's basically the challenge here. This is, I think, this is the best way to define variability um, where it actually has some context, takes into account like how things are actually spread, up, spread out within your range of your data. And so let's think about how we could try to do this. Um, so we'll create this set of values again um, in the table. And then let's just double check our average value as well. So 4.25. Um, 
And so one thing we can do is let's take a look at how far away each value in our data set is from the, from the mean. So we can do this. We can say deviations equals values minus the average value. And then we can put that into a table. Um, and so here we have our values, two, three, three, nine. And then now we also have another column which tells us how far away each value is from the mean. So two is negative 2.25 away from 4.25. And then three is negative 1.25 away from 4.25. And then nine is positive 4.75. So this is basically telling you how far away things are. Um, and so nine, for example, is like really far away. Two is like kind of far away, but not that far away. And it's far away in the negative direction. Um, so this is kind of giving us a sense of, you know, how far away things are. Um, and so now that we know how far away things are, we need to come up with one number. So like, what's one way I could come up with one number to summarize like these deviations? Like I know how far away each number is. Yeah, let's take the average value, right? So um, we could do sum deviations divided by length deviations. So here we get zero. So that's kind of interesting. Um, so the average deviation is zero. Like that's kind of funny, right? Um, let's see what's going on. So let's take away the length and let's just sum up the deviations. So that's also going to be zero, actually. Um, and the reason that you get zero is because if you remember, um, what we're doing here is deviations is values minus average value, but average value is already the sum of deviations or is, is already the sum of these values divided by the length. So if you're just trying to take the average of this, it's going to basically be zero. Um, so average of your deviation is actually always going to be zero. This is true for any, uh, any distribution. So we can't actually do that. So some people are suggesting maybe you could take absolute value. Uh, some people are saying we can maybe square the values. Um, so let's actually try to square the values. So we'll try to do that instead. Um, and so the reason we might square them is because that makes them positive. So this deviation of negative 2.25, that becomes positive five. And then this deviation of negative 1.25, that becomes positive 1.56 um, and so on. And so now we've squared them. Now they're, they're positive. They're larger than they were before, but it's all relative anyway. So you know, we're still preserving that like nine's really far away because 4.75 is a lot bigger than these numbers. That's still the case over here, 22.56, uh, still really far away. Um, and so now we have a way to kind of quantify how far away things are squared. Um, and then what we could do now is now let's try to take the average. And so this is actually called the variance. Um, and so if we take the average of the squared deviations, that's the variance. And so now we get 7.68. So this is basically telling us how far away are things um, squared on average. Um, and so that's essentially what the number we have here. And then finally, what we could do is if we want to get this back into the original units, because when you square something, the units get squared too. Like if this is pounds, the deviation is going to be negative 2.25 pounds. Squared deviation is going to be five pounds squared, which is kind of weird. Um, and so taking the average of this column squared deviation is going to give you something in pounds squared, we, but we want something in pounds. So we'll just take the square root of this. Um, and so we take the square root of this, we get 2.77. And so this is actually the standard deviation. So this is kind of how we calculate it. Um, so you kind of like subtract the mean, then square what that value is, take the average of all of those squared deviations, and then finally do a square root to get back to the original units. Um, and so we get 2.77. Um, and so you can actually do all of this math with just one line using NumPy. So you could do np.std and then values, and that gives you the same thing. So that's how you can do it in kind of one line. So yeah, I can go through these steps again. So firstly, we computed our average. So, you know, we're trying to understand the variability around the average. So you got to calculate the average first. So we use np.average to do that. Then we take each of our values and subtract the average value. That's called the deviation. So now we have our like deviations from the mean for all the values in our distribution. Um, we know like how far each of them is from the average. Once you have our deviations, we'll square them. So that's what we did here. We created the square deviation. So we had the deviations, just squared the value. Um, then what we said is let's take the average of the squared column. 
So we have all our square deviations, take their average. That's the that's actually called the variance. Um, and then once you have the variance, you just take the square root of that to get back into the units that you want. And that's the standard deviation. Um, so that's kind of the calculation there. Um, and so people are asking like, why do we square it? Um, why don't we just take like the absolute value and take the average value of that? So some of the reasoning for that is kind of beyond the material we'll cover in this course. But if you take later statistics, you'll learn why the squared one is preferred. There's a lot of reasons why it ends up being kind of just, it's actually just better for a lot of reasons, but um, I wouldn't worry too much about those right now. Um, but yeah, the main thing is we have to take a square root at the end because we square the deviations in the beginning. So um, this, the, I, the way to interpret standard deviation is basically it's a rough, it's a rough measure of how far away the data are from from the average, um, on average. <laughs> so that's kind of funny, but basically this is the definition. So root mean square deviation from the average, and the way you compute it actually, if you if you can memorize this phrase right here, root mean square deviation from the average, it the way you calculate it is actually just read this in reverse. So step one is take the average then take the deviations of each value from the average, then square those deviations, then take the mean of those square deviations, and then finally take the square root. So this basically tells you the actual way to go through the math for it. Um, and so again, we take the square root here because we did a square over here. So they have to kind of like get the units back to the proper units. So it's really, really important to take the, um, uh, square root at the end. Um, so the variance is the mean of the square deviations. Yes, that's correct. Exactly. Um, yeah, I can repeat that again. So basically, the way we do the math to calculate standard deviation is the definition, but just backwards. So the definition is root mean square of deviations from the average. So if you wanted to actually calculate the standard deviation of some new data set, first thing you do is find the average value of the data set. So you could use MP of average to do that. If, if it's not that many numbers, you can actually just like count up all the value, like sum up all the values, divide by the length of the number of values. So that's the average. Once you have the average, then you calculate the deviations from the average. So take all of your values and subtract what the average is um, from each individual value. And then once you have those deviations, which is like how far each value is from the average, square that value. So square that for every row in your table. Um, once you have the square deviations, now you just take the average of those square deviations. That's the variance. Um, and once you have the average of the square deviations, just take the square root at the end. So last step is just square root, that single number that you have now. Um, so basically an average gives you like one number the deviations, you're gonna have as many deviations as you have rows. So you have like hundred rows in your table, you're gonna have hundred deviations. And then you're gonna square all those hundred deviations. So again, you're gonna have like hundred squared deviations. And then once you take the mean of that, you're just gonna have one value now, which is your average squared deviations. Um, and then now that you have that one value, just take the square root. That's the last step. Um, so someone said you take the average twice. Yeah, that's technically true. You take the average once to compute the average of all your values, and then you take the average again, which is the average of the squared deviations. Um, because the idea is we don't want to just, we want to understand how far away things are from our mean, but on average, because every value has a different distance from the mean. Like some values are close to the mean, some values are far from the mean. So we just want to get a sense of like how far is our data from its mean on average. So that's kind of why it's taking two averages. Um, and so why do we use the standard deviation? So there's two main reasons. Um, the first is that there's some interesting properties about the standard deviation. So no matter what the shape of the distribution is, no matter how it looks, whether everything's clumped in the middle or everything's like out to the sides, uh, the bulk of the data is gonna be within the average plus or minus a few standard deviations. This is just a property um, about statistics. Um, and so we'll go over like an actual law about it. That's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, and so the standard deviation kind of gives you a really good way to make like guesses about where most data should be, regardless of what the distribution looks like. And so that's very powerful and very helpful. 
Um, and the second reason is something we'll go over in the next lecture. So going into kind of that first reason that we mentioned, which is, you know, uh, being able to kind of understand something like distribution using just the standard deviation and the average. So this is a property called Chebyshev's inequality. Um, and so the idea is no matter what the shape of the distribution, um, the bulk of the data are going to be in this range, average plus or minus a few SDs. And specifically, um, this is the way, there's actually a mathematical formula for this. So basically what this is saying is the proportion of values that lie in the range average plus or minus Z SDs is at least one minus one over Z squared. So if you want to know, like, let's say Z is two. So that basically means that the proportion of values that are within two standard deviations of the mean is going to be at least one minus one over two squared. Um, so basically that's three fourths, 75%. So 75% of the data is within um, the, the two standard deviations of the average. And so this just shows the values for different values of Z. So um, for any distribution, if you know it's average and you know it's standard deviation, then within three standard deviations, you'll have at least 88% of the data. And so the way you calculate that, it's one minus one divided by three squared. So three squared is nine, so you get one minus one ninth. And then for four standard deviations, do the same thing, but here you get one minus one sixteenth. And so if you do one standard deviation, uh, the rule just does one minus one divided by one, that's just gonna be zero. So at least 0% of the data is within one standard deviation. So that's not that helpful. You already knew that probably. Um, so it's, that's why it's not listed here. But um, yeah, but basically we're just, what this is saying is you, your data set, it has some average and it has some standard deviation. And we're just saying how many times do we need to multiply the standard deviation? Like how far do we need to go out from the mean on both sides to capture like a certain percent of the data? And so all this is saying is like, if I take the average and then I add two standard deviations to the right and two standard deviations to the left, then at least 75% of the data is gonna be within that range. That's what it's saying. Um, and they hold for any distribution. And so someone said, how do we know how many to use? Um, so typically like you'll be, you'll be asked a question like, okay, I want to, I want to have at least like, I don't know, 90% of the data. So like how many standard deviations out do I need to go to get at least 90% of the data? Um, in this case, you would want to go four standard deviations because 93 is kind of above 90%, whereas 88 doesn't guarantee 90%. So um, that's like one way that you might be asked the question about this. So let's actually see this in the demo. Um, so let's go back to our data set of all the babies that we were working with last week. Um, so this is the one where like some of the moms had smoked, some of them had not. And so let's actually take a look at the distribution, um, empirical distribution in this data set of all the variables um, in, this, in this table. So first up we have birth weight. So birth weight looks like it's mostly like centered around 120 and then it kind of spreads out to both sides. It's like almost symmetric basically. Um, we have gestational days, which is also like basically symmetric. Although it looks like there might be some values out here that aren't shown because they really only appear a few times. Um, maternal age does not look symmetric. So maternal age has this tail going out to the right. Um, and so for this one, you know, probably the median is like somewhere around 25, but the mean is going to be, you know, greater than 25 because it's going down to the right. Um, and then maternal height, uh, this one is, seems like it's kind of symmetric here, centered around 63, 64-ish. And then finally, we have maternal pregnancy weight. So this one also looks kind of like the other one that we saw above where it's not symmetric. So there's a kind of a tail going out to the right. And so again, for this one, the median is probably around 125-ish, but the mean is greater than that because we see that there's a tail to the right and that's gonna drag out the average. So these are just some examples of distributions. Um, and so 
one thing we can do is let's focus on maternal pregnancy weight. So we have this, this last graph here essentially. Um, and so let's take a look at the mean and standard deviation. So the mean is 128 here. So a little bit past 125, kind of what we expected to see. And then the standard deviation is 20. So what this means is um, on average, we can expect the maternal pregnancy weights to be um, 20 um, you know, pounds, I guess, away from 128. That's like on average. Um, some people are gonna be more than that. Some people are gonna be less than that away from 128. And so let's check whether um, Joey Chan's inequality actually works properly here. So let's take all the births where the maternal pregnancy weight is between um, three standard deviations below the mean and three standard deviations above the mean. So we're gonna call this within three SDs. And then let's count up how many people in this data set are actually within three SDs. What's the proportion? So in this case, 98.6% uh, of the women in this data set um, had a maternal pregnancy weight within three standard deviations of the average um, of this data set. So again, standard deviation and average, that's all relative to our sample itself. So all we're saying here is that like 98.6% of our sample is within three standard deviations of um, the average of the sample. And so it's just giving us a sense of like how close things are, how far away things are apart. Um, and so if you wanna check this with Chebyshev's bound, um, Chebyshev says that, okay, we're looking at three standard deviations. So the, that means we need to do one minus one divided by three squared. So one over nine essentially. Um, and so this proportion gives us 88.8%. So Chebyshev is basically saying, before we even look at the distribution, Chebyshev is saying 88.8% of the data should be within three standard deviations. And it turns out 98.6% of the data. So this is correct. It was at least 88.8. So it is actually correct here. Um, so this is just showing you like a case of where it's actually correct. Um, and it should always be correct. But, um, so let's just stop for a couple of questions there. Um, is the standard deviation always a number between zero and a hundred or could be anything? So standard deviation can be anything, but it has to be positive for sure. So it definitely has to be more than zero. And the reason for that is because, um, you know, we square our values and then we take the square root of it. So you're not going to get a negative number there. So it's going to be positive, but it could be anything. If your data is like really, really far apart and like it's all spread around, um, or the units are really large, you could have a standard deviation like in the thousands. Um, so really think of standard deviation is just like how far do things tend to be from the average? So if we were looking at this graph, the average is probably a little bit past 125. Uh, we know it's 128 down below, but basically it's 128 around here. And so how far apart are all these other values in this distribution from 128 on average? And so that is 20 in this case. So like most on average things are like 20 away. Sometimes things are like 40 away, sometimes they're 60 away but on average, they're about 20 more. That's kind of the way to think about it. Um, and so why is it three times SD? Uh, that's just how we, that was just arbitrary. We wanted to just check three standard deviations. You could, you could have checked two if you wanted. You can check whatever you like, um, but we specifically wanted to check three. So we just wanted to see how much data actually is in within three standard deviations. And then we wanted to compare that to what the Chebyshev's formula would have predicted. So Chebyshev's formula basically says at least this much data should be within three standard deviations. It turns out 98.6% of the data was within that. So the idea of Chebyshev is really to actually give an accurate prediction. It's just telling you like at least this much data is going to be within, um, within this range. And so what's, yeah, what's really crazy about Chebyshev's bounds or inequality is that this is true no matter what the distribution looks like. And that's what makes it very useful. That's also why it's not gonna be such a good prediction, but it, at least it's useful in the sense that we know at least this much data is gonna be within you know, three standard deviations for any, um, any uh, distribution. So that's why it's really useful.
Okay, so last thing uh, I'll try to talk about is standard units. Um, so it's really common to convert all of your values into a reference frame of like how far they are from the mean in standard, in terms of standard deviation. So basically like scale for standard deviation. So I could have like some data that's like, um, you know, has units in the thousands and I have some other data set that's has units like really, really small. Like it's just, it just gets as high as like 10. But if I wanted to compare like how much things are, you know, spreading around within both of them, what I could do is uh, like convert all of those into the same scale. And so that's called standard units. And the idea there is um, thinking about how many SDs above average is something. So, I mean, this is a common thing that's used when we're talking about test scores, right? So like this semester might be very different from another semester, but if I want to know like how good a score is in this particular semester or how different it is from a different semester, um, you want to be able to compare them together. So you, things are relative. It depends on the standard deviation, basically. That determines like context. And so if you wanted to understand like how many standard deviations things are from the average, that's something that is going to be the same on the same units on the same scale, no matter which distribution you're looking at. So it basically allows you to compare things from like different distributions. Um, and so the way you calculate this is typically we call it Z. Um, and the way it works is you just take whatever value you're interested in, subtract the average, and then divide by standard deviation. So again, value minus average, that's just deviation. We went over that before. So all we're doing is we're taking our deviation of this value from the average and then dividing it by the standard deviation. Um, and so this makes it kind of this like, it's a, now it's become kind of this like universal deviation rather than a specific deviation that depends on like your units and like how big your, your specific values are for this data set. Um, and then the way you can interpret the results is like negative Z basically means the values below the average, positive Z means the values above the average, the closer Z is to zero, the closer your value is to the average. Um, and so when values are in standard units, then your average is gonna be zero in standard units. Because if I just plug in average into this value on the left here, I'm just gonna get average minus average, that's zero. So that's the nice thing about standard units. It converts all, the, all of your values into something that has the scale where like average is zero. And then also the SD is exactly one. So that's also kind of interesting about this too. And so with Chebyshev's inequality, what this is it's gonna say is if you convert your data into standard units, then at least 96% of your standardized values are gonna be between negative five and five. That's what this means. And so this statement is really powerful because this applies to any distribution. So if you take any distribution and then convert all the values into standard units, this property is going to be true. Um, and so we can do a quick demo of this. So this is how we actually calculate standard units. So we've made a function here called standard units. Um, and the way it works is you take your value X, subtract the average, so np.mean, and then divide by the standard deviation, np.standardx. So that's our function. And so we could actually do this for um, one of the columns in our table. So let's take maternal age, and then let's convert age into standard units. Um, and then we can take once you've converted to standard units, we can just take a look at the mean and the standard deviation. Um, and so when we look at the mean of, of age and standard units, we get negative 7.86, but then it's like times 10 to the negative 17. So basically that means zero. So this is essentially zero. And then um, the standard deviation is one now. And so what's cool is this is gonna be the case no matter what column we choose here. You could choose any other column and run it through these lines of code. And the average is going to be zero, and then standard deviation is going to be one. And that the reason that's important is because it's then going to allow us to compare the two distributions. Um, so we'll go over in the next lecture like how we actually compare that, why that's useful, um, and we'll we'll review this in the next lecture as well. But that's mainly kind of the power of standard units is that you can start to compare to distributions that are on completely different units with completely different scales. Um, but you can still get a sense of comparing the shapes and things like that. Um, why do we need 
standard units. I thought the mean and standard deviation are in the units of data set. That's correct. So the mean and standard deviation are in the units of the data set. Um, the main reason to con con uh, convert things into standard units is so that you can compare two different data sets. So if I wanted to compare like distribution of, you know, the age of the mothers with also the distribution of like the weights of the mothers, those are on different units and they're on different scales. Like age may not be that wide apart, but you know, uh, weight might vary a lot more. But if I want to be able to compare things together across two different distributions with completely different units, then that's why we would convert to standard units. Because once you do standard units, everything is in the same units. Um, so that's the main reason. And we'll go over some examples of that next lecture. Cool. I'll stop the lecture or I'll stop the screen recording there, but I'll stay on for questions.